While supporters say the amendment is about public safety, there are a lot of questions about it. I pose some of them to one of its chief backers, Republican Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters. As I understand it, right now, courts can consider public safety when determining whether or not a person can be released uh, at all with preventative detention hearings where people can be denied bail. So what does this amendment do beyond that? How does it really require public safety to be considered when it's when well, if it's not already? I, we can, I can give you the quote that the Supreme Court of Ohio said that when setting a monetary bond, public safety shall not be considered. OK, now there are provisions to get us into a no bond situation. Usually it's a murder case, but a lot of tr crimes uh, in the revised code are not eligible for no bond at all. So you, for instance, we have a bad domestic violence case, and those are usually, frankly, our worst cases because these guys get out, they come back and they re-abuse, kill, hurt the their their wife or girlfriend or kids. And that's not even eligible for a no bond hearing if we have a bad guy like that. So this thing clearly, it has been happening for 200 years in Ohio that judges can consider the safety of the community when they set a bail. And in January, a case out of Hamilton County, the Supreme Court ruled that safety shouldn't be considered when setting a bail. And so we have this, I mean, it, it caused chaos in Hamilton County and throughout the state. And judges were saying, hey, I can't help it. This is what the Supreme Court said, that basically what they asked them is, how much can you afford? Now, there's a lot of misinformation floating out there that all these nonviolent first offenders are in jail and poor people are in jail and rich people are running wild, killing people and all this nonsense. Look, there's no cap on bonds. For instance, there's no ceiling. So if Elon Musk comes to Cincinnati and kills three people and we think he's a danger, the judge could set a bond at a trillion dollars and nothing stops the judge from setting a high bond on a wealthy person. So that's just nonsensical. We had this entire issue was was um, raised two years ago down here in Cincinnati, at least. And it's kind of been going nationwide that we need bond reform, bail reform. This first time nonviolent offenders are in jail. And I said at that time, and I'll continue to say it. Tell me who is in our jail that shouldn't be there. Just tell me who it is, because if there's somebody who is nonviolent, first offender, not a danger to the community, I'm going to get them out myself. I don't want somebody in taking up a space in jail that's nonviolent and he, he made a mistake. That's not the kind of offender we're going after. We're going after violent people. Now, there have been estimates that up to 60% of people in Ohio jails, about 12,000 people a day, are there because they can't afford bail. And of course, staying in jail means that they could lose custody of their kids, they could lose their jobs, they could lose their homes. So I'm wondering if you have any idea of how many people could be affected by this. Well, first of all, let's just say in little Hamilton County in Cincinnati, uh, right now in our justice center, which holds about 900 people, we have 131 people in the justice center on some type of homicide charge, 131. Okay. So when people hear this, well, there's 60% of the criminals can't afford their bond. Well, good. I hope they don't afford their bond. That's a good thing for the for the community that they're not just running around killing other people. We I'm going to have a press conference tomorrow where we have a guy who murdered three people. I mean, this thing goes on and on and on. And these are prior offenders. We got a guy that um, it's going to come out tomorrow. We have a guy, two guys that killed a bunch of people. They still had their ankle bracelets on when they shot and murdered these people. So, I mean, all this nonsensical stuff like, oh, these poor working families that they're not going to be able to take care of their kids and all. That is just nonsense. And if they have a name of someone who that applies to, would you please ask them who it is? Because I've never seen one. I've never seen a nonviolent first offender 
not afford bail and be in our jail. I've just never seen it. It's just this mythical, anecdotal, and that, frankly, bull crap. How would this affect the change that was ordered last year by the Ohio Supreme Court that 28 counties with both multiple municipal courts and county courts would use a uniform bail schedule and the first option must be releasing people on personal recognizance bonds? Would that would this amendment affect that? And this, this I don't think so toward- at all. I think, as a matter of fact, we we our pretrial services people down in Cincinnati, they they work very hard and develop a score sheet for these judges so they know who is safe to release and who's not. They do that based on prior offenses and things of that nature. You know, if they got a job, if they got a family, if they're rooted in the community, uh, there's all kinds of factors that the judges consider. But the one factor that was removed by the Supreme Court in January was the safety of the community, which I think is really important, Um, especially when you see people reoffending constantly um, in our court system. I mean, there are, I would guess, in Ohio, at least one or two stories a week where somebody's out on bond and commits another horrible crime. It just ha- it happens here all the time. I have to assume it's happening in Cleveland. It's happening in Columbus and Toledo and Dayton. What about the presumption of innocence, though? A lot of these people are there before they've been tried. They are accused of right. something. Is bail really a substitute for allowing people to go out when they have been uh when they're still there's a presumption of innocence there well there well why could you ever affect an arrest how could you detain anybody if he's not guilty until a jury or judge convicts him i mean you're that's it's it's nonsensical you can hold dangerous people pre-trial that's just the way the system is set up to protect the community now if if your theory or whoever's theory that is, it's nonsense, says that they're innocent until proven guilty, well, um, so why, why, how could you arrest somebody ever? How could you detain them if they haven't been proven guilty? Well, it's just because his police officer saw him shoot somebody three times. Well, is that enough for you? I think it's enough. And that, you know, look, People aren't languishing in prison. If you're held on a on a felony, we have 90 days to try you. I mean, that's it. Okay. You I don't know what your lifestyle is that 90 days we have to be ready to go to trial. If you're in jail longer than 90 days, you've asked to be in jail longer than 90 days. You want the continuance. You want to do something else. And usually frankly, it's a strategy to stretch out as long as you can your case. And this is no secret. They stretch out their cases as long as they can, especially if they're out. Witnesses fall off the face of the earth. They get intimidated. All kinds of things happen. But if you want, if you say, gosh, darn it, I'm innocent. I want a trial right now. The judge has to grant it within 90 days. There's no way you're going to be in jail for two years without having to try. It just doesn't happen. Now, while both the candidates for governor have said they are going to vote for issue one, or they already have, whichever one it is, there is a lot of opposition. Although wait till um, election day for your cameras, right? <laughs> well, that, they're, 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 voting on election day is a big thing, of course. Yeah. Um, there's opposition from faith groups. There's opposition from the ACLU and the conservative Buckeye Institute. You've gotten some editorials that have been written against Uh, issue one, a lot of it focusing on protecting lower income people who are accused of crimes and don't have the money for bail. But you're saying there aren't that many of those people in the system? No, I'm not. And I've asked. I've asked when we had people run for city council two years ago, some of which have been convicted of federal offenses since then. But they called for a um, change in the way we do it because all of these innocent people are Nonviolent people are in our jail and it's clogging up the system. And I said at that time, give me a name, please just tell me who you're talking about. Because this mythical person that's out there that is innocent, he's nonviolent, he does something, you know, that they, they that he's being held for I because he can't make a bond. I doesn't it doesn't exist. I don't know what world these people are living in. But they want to change the rules. And let me just go back. First of all, 
if anybody thinks the Buckeye Institute is conservative, they're wrong. Okay. I know traditionally they have been, but if they have, I don't know where they're getting their funding from. I got a sense they're getting it from Arnold Ventures, which is a Soros backed group that is trying to push this bail reform through. So the Buckeye Institute has no credibility with me, number one. Number two, the editorials that have been written, the Plain Dealer wrote an editorial, which I read. Of course, they never called anybody from issue one. They just recite the ACLU's talking points. We never heard a word from the Plain Dealer. I went down to the Enquirer and talked to them. We haven't heard a word from them. You know, look, I don't expect the media is going to support this. But I'm telling you what, Ohioans are smarter than this. And they're going to send a clear message in less than two weeks that the safety of the community is important. And we're going to take action when you have a runaway court like this. This is unprecedented in Ohio that the Supreme Court would say safety cannot be considered when setting a bond. It is ridiculous. I want to ask you about that Cleveland.com editorial where it said that giving the power on bail rules to state lawmakers and taking the Ohio Supreme Court out of it is a, quote, fraught and hazardous move that will subject bail rules and potentially other criminal justice reforms to how the political winds blow. This was expected to be a good year for Republicans, given that it's a midterm and there's a Democrat in the White House. Is that part of why this is on the ballot now, not just because of the decision in January from the Supreme Court, but also because this was going to be a good year for Republicans? I think it's going to be a good year for Republicans, but that is not why we fought to get this on the ballot. When that case came out in January, I I personally had no sense of what was going to happen this fall in terms of the president's approval rating or anything like that. I know what it did in Hamilton County and the shock waves it sent through the criminal justice system that judges couldn't consider public safety. That is the reason we went to the legislature and got three fifths of the house and three fifths of the Senate. And I should note for you this too. And I, I try my best because I represent everybody in the Hamilton County, Democrats, independents, Republicans. When we went to get this on the ballot, every single Democrat voted against putting public safety on the ballot when judges said bail. And I find that astounding because they tend to represent the areas where they're impacted most by these violent offenders that keep doing this over and over in their communities. And it's not until almost invariably, it's not until one of their relatives is murdered or hurt by one of these people that are repeat violent offenders. Then all of a sudden they're, oh my gosh, we, then we have marches in the street, stop killing our kids and all this stuff. You can stop killing the kids by letting the judge have the authority to lock up violent people, period. Is cash bail the way to deal with violent crime, though? Ultimately, no. I mean, it is like many of our measures. It's after the fact. I mean, violent crime. I'm not a sociologist, but I know who's committing the violent crime. It's a very, very small number of people that are committing a lot of violent crime in our communities. I think. In Franklin County, they did a study where they named like 400 people that are committing the crimes. And it's the same way in Hamilton County. We have a small number of people that are hurting the community. And unfortunately, it's because of the way they were raised, that they don't have any parents in their life. They're being raised by grandmas. They got the, the male authority figure in their life is a drug dealer on the street. They get swept up in these gangs. I mean, the gang murders and some of the offenses that we're going to be released in the next week are frightening. And in the age of these defendants, we had last year, we had 19 juveniles charged with murder. 19 juveniles. This is a system I've set up to deal with shoplifters, not killers. And these guys are killers. They're, they're out hunting people down and shooting them because they listen to a certain song. I'm not joking about that.